Hi everyone and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. This is part two in my Amiga 4000 repair video series. If you haven't watched part one yet, I recommend you do that first because this is a continuation of that part. All right then, let's get right to it. Okay, it's the next day and I've slept on this Amiga 4000, not literally on it, but I've slept thinking about the things that are wrong with this thing. I was a bit all over the place with the video yesterday because I was working on like three things at once. So I wanna recap exactly what I've done and where we are right now with this machine. So I washed the motherboard, I removed all the original leaky caps and the leaky battery and I replaced the caps with new Panasonic ones from console five, along with the two electrolytics. I also added some pin headers for the battery so I can connect that in the future. And then I started troubleshooting. Right off the bat, I found that the real-time clock I see was not being seen by the operating system. And checking the schematics for this chip, it seems like this uh, 74HCT174, which is a hex flip-flop used sort of as an address latch, was seemingly faulty. So it was very corroded, the pins from the leaky battery. So I removed it with some hot air and then I scratched up all the kind of crud that was all over these pads and then used solder wick to clean it up as best I could. And I have to say, I'm pretty pleased with how that turned out. It looks really good. Unfortunately, after going through all my spare parts, I don't have a spare service mount IC, so I'm gonna have to order that. But the Amiga can totally work without the RAM chip connected. And with this chip missing, there's no way the OS can actually communicate with this chip. So right now it's just gonna continue to be not seen. Booting into Workbench off of the GoTech here shows that the computer was recognizing the full two megs of chip memory and 16 megabytes of fast RAM, but something weird was going on inside of SysInfo. When I was booted in TSC mode, I, it was showing that this thing had an ECS Agnes chip, which just isn't possible, right? Because this thing is not an ECS chipset board, it's AGA. Right here is the Alice chip. This is the chip in the AGA chipset that replaced the ECS Agnes. And right by it is a jumper to select between NTSC and PAL. It's simple as switching this to change the mode of your computer from boot. And I found that while booted in NTSC, which of course is the native scan rate here in the US, that's when SysInfo was saying that the Alice chip was actually an ECS Agnes. But when I switched this to PAL, lo and behold, SysInfo reported Alice chip as an Alice chip. So I posted on Twitter to see if anyone else could reproduce this issue and see if this was a bug in SysInfo, but so far I haven't been able to get an, an answer from anyone as of while I film. This chip right here is a parallel 8-bit input and serial output shift register. And it seems to be used in conjunction with these jumpers on this header here to actually set the high byte of the Alice ID. And I checked on an oscilloscope, the serial output of this, and it definitely appears to be working perfectly. And also in the OS, I can see the high byte of the Alice chip changing as I change these jumpers. So this shift register is working. Apparently if it's not, you can have issues. This chip right here is also a shift register and can be damaged from a leaking battery. And this is a shift register used for the joystick and the mouse inputs. If this chip is bad, you're gonna have strange mouse behavior or no mouse behavior at all. So this leaves me with the final fault that I can find and it seems to be related to the RAM. Let me see if I can get the computer to reproduce this problem that I'm talking about. While, as I showed you before, when I turn on the computer, it usually shows that it has two megs of chip memory and 16 megs of fast RAM, which is expected, right? But I find that occasionally when I turn the computer off and back on again, sometimes I get a yellow flashing screen and then the computer boots, or I'll get a crash, a software error. So far, so good, it's booting every time here. Just keep power cycling until it does it. Watch it not have the problem. Okay, there we go, software failure. So this happened right at boot, right? So if we boot the computer up the rest of the way, I push the mouse button, and right now it's booting off the GoTech. I have the Amiga Test Kit 1.7 in here. This program used to be called SysTest, I think. It's an open source project on GitHub. I'll put a link to it in the description, and it's a diagnostic of sorts for the Amiga. Now, if I push F1, look, two megabytes of chip memory, zero megabytes of fast memory. What, what exactly is going on? Now, the weird thing is, is it's only showing one bank of memory, the chip memory. 
But what happens is I can actually test a custom range by pushing F4. And I'm gonna enter the start address as seventh and all zeros. And I'm gonna add the end address as seven FFFFF, which is 16 megabytes. So when this fast memory is working, it exists within this address space in the Amiga. And now I'm gonna hit F1 for test. And there it is, it's actually testing the memory right now. So even though Kickstart detected zero megs of fast memory, this is actually showing all 16 megs. And I can assure you it'll run through this entire test and work perfectly. And just in case you're curious, if you try to test outside of that area, like say I'm gonna switch this to eight and all zeros and eight FFF, if I hit F1 to test, it will immediately crash. And that's because there is no memory there. And I guess the memory management unit detects that and then will immediately do this, which is like a kernel panic. So if I turn the computer off and back on again, let's see if I can get it to do the yellow screen. No yellow screen. Boy, it, it was doing it last night and it just it seems to be random. At least you saw it crash that one time. Let's check memory. Look, it says zero megs of fast memory again. Turn this back off and on. It's working every time, except for that one crash, but it's still showing zero megs of fast memory. All right, now we're back to 16 megabytes of fast memory. I'll hit Control Amiga Amiga to reboot it. And let's see, you know, if we go back in, let's just keep checking this. 16 megabytes, reboot again. This time I'm doing the reboot. Even with software reboots, I say, I find that sometimes you can still have issues, although it seems to be working very reliably right now. All right, so it's working very reliably. Now I'm gonna eject this floppy disk and I'm gonna reboot the computer and it will boot into Workbench. I've actually plugged in a compact flash card and I've installed it. Look how quickly it boots up. It seems to work very reliably. If I reboot the computer, it will boot into Workbench pretty much every time, but sometimes I'll get that yellow screen. So let's see if we get a yellow screen now. Boy, this particular problem is just camera shy. All right, well, it is showing zero memory in Workbench here, so it's definitely having the problem. But if I hit the reboot command from the keyboard, now we're back to having a full 16 megs of RAM. So it's very strange how it's just kind of comes and goes, right? 16 megabytes again. Okay, booting back into this. So we have two megs of chip, 16 megs of fast, and I can do test all memory, and I can leave this running for hours, which I did last night, and it detects no problems whatsoever. It does a random fill, and then it does some checkerboard tests. Now, since I'm having RAM problems, a lot of people said that I might have problems with a bus transceiver. This is one of the bus transceivers for the RAM. The RAM is 32 bits wide, and these are 8 bit wide each. So you need four of these. One is here, and there are three more over here. There's one there, and then there's two more tucked under the memory. Those four chips make up the connections for the data lines from the RAM to the rest of the computer. And yeah, if one of these is bad, you can have all sorts of issues on the RAM. And then note that this only would affect the fast memory and not the chip memory. The chip memory does not go through these same transceivers. So you might be having an issue where your fast RAM is not recognized at all, or it's very random and crashy, and that could be easily one of these transceivers. Now I scoped all the signals on all four of these transceivers and I also checked all the connectivity, well, especially of the one over here because it was near this capacitor and the leaky battery, right? So we could have damage there. And there is corrosion on the pins. Like there's evidence that this has been corroded, but I saw absolutely nothing out of the ordinary on the signals on this chip, especially while I was running the diagnostics on the RAM, you could see very specific patterns on these signals while the RAM check was running and it matched on all four of these chips. I really have a hard time believing that there's anything wrong with this particular IC. So since everything on the motherboard looked perfect, I started looking at maybe the SIMs were a problem. And what I did is I Googled this JDEC standard for 72 pin memory. I wanted to know how these memory modules are designed because you can get them in various sizes and with ECC and, and non-ECC. And I wanted to find out that maybe these RAM chips aren't compatible with the motherboard or, or something like that. So I found this document on Google and I'll link to it in the description below. Here are all the various memory modules that are available in the 72 pin configuration. And it turns out that there's an ECC signal, but there's also four presence detect signals. And you see where it says S or O, S means shorted and O means open. And these signals on the memory modules should be detectable by the computer when you put them in so it can tell exactly what kind of module it is. So I have a couple modules right here and you can see very clearly the presence detect signals. 
See these little resistors here and these pads, these four on both of these, those are those signals and they all are routed down to the, down to the pins right here on these SIMs. And looking at the chart on the computer, I can actually tell what kind of memory modules these are. So this module right here is the two megabyte chip memory that I took out of this computer, the one that was bad, right? And I noticed that it's got short, 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 and open as the configuration. Also, this module, which was also in the computer, now this is ECC because it's got these chips here, which is eight of them, plus these four. So that's used for error correction. It's an ECC module. But that doesn't really matter for the Amiga. I'm pretty sure it doesn't use that. So it would just ignore that. But it also has short, 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 and open for the, the four connections there on the presence detect. And when we look here at the chart and you look for short, 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 open, it gives us right here four megabytes, 70 nanoseconds. And sure enough, looking at these parts, these are 70 nanosecond chips. And when I go look up the part number of the chip online, these are definitely four megabyte memory modules. So even though the chip memory was only being used for two megabytes, it's still a four megabyte SIM. So then I started looking at the memory modules that I installed in the Amiga. Now there were no markings on these to tell me what size they were. So if you remember, I found these memory modules in my box of memory and I installed them in this computer because I liked how low profile they are. But I just assumed that these were four megabyte modules. Well, I think I assumed incorrectly. Here are the four pads for the presence detect. And you might be able to notice that only the top one is soldered and the other three are open. And that's the same on all four of these modules. Taking a look at this chart, if we go here and we go short, open, 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 there it is right there, 60 nanoseconds, one megabyte. These are not four meg sims, they are one megabyte sims. So that's one clue that these are one meg sims, but to know for sure, I need to look up the part number of these chips. Well, I did that last night. These are Hyundai chips and they are indeed one megabyte chips. Well, basically two chips make up 256K. So each chip is 256K times four bits. So you need a pair of them for 256K. And of course we have four pairs, which totals one megabyte. Now it really appears that the Amiga does not use these presence detect signals. And it has a jumper right here to select between one megabyte modules or four megabyte modules. And of course I had it set for four megabyte modules, which is what it's set to right now. Let's take this jumper off the four meg position and move it to the one megabyte position. Now it is listed right here at 256 times 32 and one meg by 32, but because we're dealing with bytes, megabytes of memory, it's actually, you wanna multiply the 256 times four because we're looking at eight bit bytes, not 32 bit bytes, right? It, anyway, so yeah, so this is the position for four megabytes of RAM. All right, so let me turn the computer on now and it should just show four megabytes of RAM, but the difference is it should be super consistent and I should not get that random crashing constantly. Two megs of chip, four megs of fast. Let's reboot the computer and we'll just try this a whole bunch of times. I mean, unfortunately, it's, it's not easy to detect because sometimes it would work consistently. So I'm just gonna keep turning this computer off and on and try to get it to give me the software error. Oh. Oh, okay, well, there goes my theory. You finally saw the yellow screen. Okay, so maybe there still is a fault with this machine. And look, it's not even booting, it's just frozen. I did a software reboot. Oh, we got there, software error. All right, well, so much for my theory. I mean, definitely this memory is not 16 megs. At least it's showing the right amount of memory there. Let's see if I can get this to show zero megabytes like it was doing before. Four megs. Well, at least it seems to be showing four megabytes properly. Let's try powering it off and on. <laughs> There's the yellow screen again. I'm wondering if this is a symptom of turning the computer off too quickly. Like maybe there's just garbage in the RAM from powering it off and it's decayed, causes that type of an issue. You have to wait longer on the Amiga. I, I don't know. And look, it's, it's hanging up like it's got some issue. Let me try rebooting. Software, I am aware, I am aware. Four megabytes. Okay, well, at least it consistently is showing four megabytes. I mean, we're still getting that random crashing, but it's just showing the right amount of RAM in here every time. So you might be wondering is why was it actually detecting 16 megs and then actually working when I did a RAM test? Well, there's probably a good reason for that. Well, look at what it's doing right now during the RAM test. Right now it's doing a random fill and then later it's gonna do what's called a checkerboard fill. And I don't know the specifics of how this is testing RAM, 
But if you try to address a one megabyte SIM as four megabytes, what's gonna happen is you're gonna end up with four copies of the same memory. So that first four megs of RAM will be mirrored three more times. And that's because there are less address lines on these SIMs than on the actual four megabyte SIMs. So as the computer tries to address those higher memory locations, it's just gonna see a copy of that first four megs of RAM. Well, if the diagnostic check is not thorough enough and to write data into the RAM that's unique per bank, when you go to read it back, if it's just a repeating pattern that's the same throughout the entire memory, even the mirrored copies you read back are gonna look okay. And I wouldn't be surprised if the random fill, which it's doing right now, when it goes to, to read back the random fill, it's just reading back looking for random data as opposed to sequential data. I don't know enough about what this RAM check is doing, but it seems like it's not thorough enough to detect that it's actually reading mirrored copies of the memory. And nor is the OS, and nor is the kickstart on boot. But maybe the kickstart is sort of good enough, and that's why it's sometimes detecting four megs, sometimes detecting zero megs, and then sometimes detecting 16 megs. If you know the answer to what's going on here about how these work, I'd love to hear your comments. But I'm 99.99999% positive this memory is actually one megs per module, which is a total of four. So the fact it was showing 16 was completely erroneous. Now booting into the OS, the reason why this is not crashing is because the chip memory on this computer is working. And some of the OS is running out of chip memory, like especially the graphics and stuff like that. And then the fast memory does have a good four megabytes. It's just mirrored over and over again. So with this fast RAM set to one megabyte SIMs, when I turn on the computer after it's been off a while, it will work pretty normally. It should just boot straight into Workbench, there it goes. But if I power cycle the machine relatively quickly like that, yellow screen, and now it's pretty much doing it every single time. It will do it once, twice, a few times, and then it will boot into Workbench, maybe? or we'll get a program error, Google meditation. Yeah, so it's just sitting here. So it's, it's kind of random what it does, but I have been playing around and once the computer does boot up, and we'll just bypass the error, once it boots up, it works totally normal. So we're getting four megs of RAM. I can run games, demos. I can leave this machine running for hours. No problems whatsoever. It completely works. It's just on the power cycle that you get those weird yellow flashing screens, like that. The fact that the computer is fully stable once you are booted up means that the RAM transceivers are all working fine. It's gotta be some kind of incompatibility with this RAM, that's, that's what I'm thinking. So I figured out something interesting. This jumper here that lets you select between one meg sims and four meg sims. If you remove it and you reboot the computer, you actually get no fast RAM. So if I reboot the computer now that the jumper is removed, the computer will boot up normally. And I found that it boots up normally 100% of the time. Now it takes longer to boot, and that's because chip memory is not as fast. Now it has zero megs of other memory, so no fast memory. Chip RAM is slower. So with the OS loading into chip RAM instead of fast RAM, it is slower. But the computer works 100% of the time rebooting, turning it off and on, no matter what you do, you never see the yellow screen ever. It just goes straight into Workbench without fail. I probably tried 30 times and it works every time. So that really bolsters my theory that there is some kind of incompatibility with its RAM and that there's not actually a fault with this motherboard at all. It's just a RAM problem the whole time. So I'm gonna remove this RAM. I've taken out the little paper spacers and let me pull this out. I hate taking the memory out. I just feel like every time I do it, I risk breaking these sockets, right? You just have to be super gentle. There we go. Only bend those tabs as much as you need so it releases the memory. Okay, the RAM is out. So I seem to have a good amount of this 72 pin memory in stock, but it's all double-sided and only the single-sided stuff is gonna fit in here. So I decided to try something out. This right here is an eight megabyte, 60 nanosecond NEC memory module. And it has all open jumpers. So when I check the uh, JDEC specification, that definitely points to eight megabytes and 60 nanoseconds. So what I've done 
is I took, I had two of these, I took one and I have converted it into a four megabyte SIM. So not only did I remove the two RAM chips, which happened to be right here, I used hot air to pull those off, but I also changed the little uh, presence detect jumpers here so that it is appropriately set for four megabytes. And I thought if this works, I don't actually need a full 16 megs of RAM in this Amiga anyways. I mean, what am I gonna use that much RAM for? So I'm just gonna put this one module in here. I'm gonna set this for the four megabyte setting, which should be this, and hopefully it'll work. Let's take a look at what happens. Okay, this memory module is in there and it's holding it in. So now I just need to set this jumper for the one megabyte setting, like so. And here we go, what's gonna happen? To be honest, I don't really know if you can convert eight megabyte modules to four megabytes like that, but maybe you can. Well, the computer booted and we're getting four megs. Okay, so now the question is if I power cycle, are we gonna get the yellow screen? Okay, so far so good and booted very quickly. Wow, look at that everyone. Does appear to be working now. Can't count my eggs before the chickens hatch though, because I don't know, you know, could be like one out of 10 times it does it. I'm just gonna keep power cycling and see if this fixes it. This is unbelievable. It really seems like it's working here. Wow. Wow, I was driving myself crazy that there was some kind of fault with this machine. When in reality, it might just been incompatibility with these memory modules. I bet there were some of you screaming at your screen watching the video telling me that that was the problem. I've never worked on a 4000 before. I've never installed memory or touched these slots before. So I just don't have a good knowledge base of what's compatible and what's not compatible with it. Well, since this memory module appears to be working fine, I have one more in stock and I'll just take the chips off the back and re-jumper it so that it is also a four meg module and I'll put it in the second slot and hopefully get eight megs of fast memory. All right, here's the second modified module, eight megabytes turned into four. Let's plug this in. I feel like installing memory is actually more dangerous for these clips than taking it out because you really have to kind of push them down and over. So I try to sort of move them around using this pick just to try to ease the burden. But anyways, the both memory modules are in and here we go. Okay, it's booting, I hear it booting. Let's first check out the memory size. Eight megabytes, okay. Oh, it's working, all right, let's turn it off and on. Look at that, look at that. Let's keep going. Oh, this is amazing. Third time. It's working. One more time. I'll do it five times and then we'll call it good. Number four, and it worked. One more time. It would have definitely given me a problem by now. I love it. All right, it's working. Eight megs of RAM. Oh, sweet. This is awesome. All right, the Amiga test kit is reinstalled into the GoTech here. Let's boot it up. I wanna check out the memory map and see what that looks like. Should boot relatively quickly off that, it did. F1 for memory. So two megs chip, eight megs fast, 10 megs total. Let's go to direct memory scan. This doesn't ever seem to do anything. It says it ignores the kickstart because this is, this is the kickstart memory scan. If I do F3, yeah, it shows no memory. It's always done that. It never actually showed anything, but if we can do a list ranges. So yeah, it's interesting that the fast memory on the Amiga 4000 starts from seven all Fs and then goes down. So if you have a full 16 megs, it starts from seven zero 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 all the way to seven FFFF. And it seems like as you install memory in there, it kind of starts from the top and then it heads down. 
originally, even with all four of those Sims installed, it was starting at, you know, 7C or whatever that it would be for four megabytes of memory. All right, so I think at this point, I need to stress test this computer again, run some demos, run some games on here, run a whole bunch of programs simultaneously, try to use up the memory and exercise the machine. Just make sure that it is rock solid. So some time has passed and I've been using the Amiga quite a bit and it's been working absolutely perfectly. So I think at this point, it's time to finish up the motherboard, clean up the case and put the computer back together. Using this Amiga has really reminded me of just how awesome the Amiga is. And I never had an EGA Amiga like this, but I would have loved it in, if I could have afforded it at the time. I've decided to leave this Amiga at eight megabytes of fast memory and two megabytes of chip memory with the memory configured as you see right here. I really don't feel like there's a reason to go above that, not to mention, I'm not sure I even have more RAM that, that I know for sure will work in this thing. I mean, maybe the original RAM that was in this machine is still good, but I'd rather just not use that because it seemed flaky. So I'm just gonna stick with what's in here now. So I still haven't received the LS174 latch chip. So I'm gonna put this computer back together without reinstalling that. Cause I think I can reinstall that into the motherboard without actually taking it all out when I get that in stock. And because of that, I'm gonna leave no battery in here. There are two pins soldered on, so I can connect a Sierra 2032. I'll do it externally with some small wires. But in the meantime, it doesn't really matter. The computer works perfectly without the clock. And really, I'm not using the 4000 in a way where missing the clock is gonna really cause any issue to me at all anyways. So one thing I need to do before I put this back together is apply a little bit of lacquer underneath here. These are some of the copper traces that I scraped away to take care of that corrosion. So I just need to cover that up again so it doesn't oxidize. In the Amiga 4000 case, there's this sheet of plastic on the bottom kind of keeps the motherboard from shorting out against the bottom of the case, I suppose. There's a little bit of dust in here, so I'm just gonna vacuum it out. One of the things I don't like about the Amiga 4000 is it's so noisy when you turn it on, specifically the fan in the power supply. So what I have here is a Panaflow, a Panasonic Panaflow fan, which is the right size. And I'm going to replace this noisy fan with this one, which is a lot quieter and still offers pretty good airflow. All right, it's assembled with a new fan. Let's see if it's much quieter. Yes, much, much quieter. Fan is on the inside of the computer, it actually sucks air in from in the computer and blows it through the power supply and out the back. So I think once the lid of the computer is on, it'll be even quieter than it is right here. I have the compact flash adapter installed. Now the power cable, I'm running under a little hole as under the slots there. 
And then the IDE data cable, I think I can just sort of drape over this top and the cover will sit flat on it. There's a little bit of space here. Now these were the original hard drives that were in this machine. I'm not gonna reinstall these, but I'm going to take the drives out and I'm gonna put the brackets back in here so those don't get lost. Before putting the bracket in that's on this side where the card slot is, there is this plastic sheet that you need to make sure you stick down there because that will prevent it from accidentally shorting out against the cards. I had to trim this corner of the card off because it was interfering with the power cord that I'm running under the, through the opening there to the compact flash adapter on the other side. So when I took this computer apart, the front LEDs weren't working because they were just not plugged in. They were sitting inside the front cover here. So I've routed the wires through the hole here and they're connected to the motherboard. And before I clip this on, let's just make sure that when I turn this on, we actually get working power and disc. And we do, excellent. So this thing, I gave it a quick clean and it looks good. So I think now it's time to pop this back on to the front. And there we go. Well, for the last several hours, I've been playing games on this Amiga 4000 and it's working absolutely perfectly. It's much quieter. Now I switched out the fan and those RAM problems all seem to be gone because stability is no longer an issue. So what have I learned from this video? Well, it's definitely important to recap Amiga 4000s, but also I've learned that the RAM is very sensitive and there's a good chance that random 72 pin memory that you might have in a box won't work reliably in the 4000 and will do unpredictable things and become crashy. So I'm glad I was able to find some memory in my box that does work and this computer is now solid. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you did, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. But if you didn't, you know what to do. You can hit that thumbs down button, hit that subscribe button if you wanna to subscribe to my channel. And of course you can hit that notification bell if you wanna be notified when I post new videos. And finally, put your comments and your suggestions down in the comment section below. And that's gonna be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.